My title is Quantitative Services Manager. Essentially, <laughs> means a sorter of beans, right? You, you sort the beans, you count the beans. Um, I do a lot of work for water quality for the tribe, and I also am their GIS person, which is Geographic Information Services, which is you know how you get with your Google phone to get to where you're going, and how UPS makes deliveries and all that kind of stuff. How the ambulance gets to your house. Um, so we've been we do a lot of things at Squaxin Island Tribe. A lot of you probably are familiar with some of the organizations we work with, like the conservation districts or the salmon enhancement groups, um, doing restoration projects. Some cool ones that are happening right now is down in Shelton Harbor. You may have seen them down there pulling out a lot of those old uh, creosote pilings and partnering, um, again, with the conservation district and actually Sierra Pacific Industries, who used to run the mill down there. Um, they're going to be restoring the salt marsh out in front of Goldsboro Creek. Um, Goldsboro has a pretty healthy coho run for uh, South Sound. And since the dam was taken out, I think, what, about eight years ago, now those fish have access to some of the upper beaches, which is mostly forestry. So it's a really, one of the few streams down here that has a really healthy coho run. So that one's ongoing. One of the things that we've been focused on here in the last year or two um, is climate change, which uh, has a tendency to affect tribes disproportionately because oftentimes they're in river basins or you know you'll think out on the coast like Quileute or um, Quinault those guys I don't know, are at risk for sea level rise or a tsunami. So for the Squaxin Island tribe what we tried to do is an analysis of sea level rise and how that's going to impact the natural resources and also the cultural resources that are you know important to the tribe, the tribal members, and the future. Uh, I don't know if anybody lives along the shoreline or has seen, you know, what is what are those group of Indians doing out on the beach? But we'll, we uh, harvest vanilla clams mostly and now getting into oysters on a lot of the um, public and private beaches in the South Salish Sea. That's a really important um, cultural activity for tribal members and it also supplements their incomes. And, you know, for the elders and for the youth. And it's just, it's great to see we go out on the beach and there'll be 80 year olds and an eight-year-old. Maybe that's a little young, but maybe 12. And it is a way for folks to get a little extra cash and also, again, you know, cultural and natural resource awareness. So Candace Penn, who's a tribal member and an Evergreen graduate, she's been working with us for about three years, and uh, she got some funding for, uh, from the EPA for a tribal uh, resiliency grant, which is to you know, study what are the risks for sea level rise or climate change and then the next phase will be to develop their resiliency. Like, how are we going to mitigate these risks? What uh, Squaxin facilities, whether it be the uh, oyster company out on Hartstein Island, um, and then some other tribal properties that are along the coastline, what do we need to do to protect those? So it's been it's been fun. We built this thing um, called a story map, which is kind of like a PowerPoint but with maps and data, and it's a great way. This is publicly available, and I shared uh, with Linda the, the uh, URL to this story map, and we encourage you to check it out. We're still polishing it a little bit and need to finish the final report. We presented this to council, and we presented it to, uh, presented it to the Capital Land Trust, and have been working with some of our other partners to make you know, them aware of some concerns the tribe has. And then the idea, again, was we'll have this assessment of the risk, and then we can leverage that towards uh, some projects to mitigate some of these risks. So it's a fun way, too, to do outreach uh, with the community. That's why when Linda called, I said, sure, I'd love to come over and, and uh, speak with you all today. I told my boss that women and voters, they're two of my favorite things, so <laughs> I guess I'll just, I'll take the break. Does anyone have any questions right up front? Please. How would we access this? Is there a website? There is. It's a little tricky because of this URL is all, you know, googly good. But I'll, I shared it with Linda, and if you guys have, like, an email group list, mm -hmm. okay. please do share. And I'll, I also have a couple of my cards. Happy to share those. And you can give me a call or shoot me an email over at uh, Squawks. Thank you. Preferably on your way to the casino. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing we did on this one, and this, these are kind of laid out with tabs. And so we wanted to introduce people to, you know, what is a Squawks Island and where is Squawks Island? You all are probably pretty familiar with South Sound. Um, before treaty times, which would be what 
1855, I believe, the Treaty of Medicine Creek was signed, which included the Nisqually tribe, the Squaxin tribe, the Tuala tribe, and the Muckleshoot tribe. There were more than 100 um, tribal members from different tribes that were attending that day. And this was back with uh, uh, Stevens, who had them sign the treaties. And we could get on to treaty rights and fishing and shellfish, but we'll talk later about that if you'd like to. What we like to inform people of is when you look at the South Puget Sound, or of course now as it's becoming known as the South Salish Sea, which is the term Salish for all of the tribes from Vancouver down to Washington. I don't know if we have to install something up. So we'd like to you know, encourage folks to check out the history of the Squaxin Island tribe. So when treaty times occurred, um, they were trying to, you know, we need to settle this land. The Indians are here, there, and everywhere. So unfortunately, it was a tough time, and they interned all of the, and it wasn't even a Squaxin Island tribe at that time. There were seven individual clans that lived in each of the seven inlets down in South Sound. You know, you have Henderson Inlet there by Lacey, and then, of course, Bud Inlet, right in Olympia, and we work around El Totten, and we're, we're down here uh, off of Oakland Bay. And then up north, you had Case Inlet and Carr Inlet. And I won't try to pronounce the Lachutzi names of these. They're very tricky. It's a very interesting language. And of course, the island is right there in the center. Um, Squaxin Island has no fresh water. So those were some tough times uh, when you know, approximately 500 Indians were interned on the island. And there were a couple Army um, regiments stationed, one uh, across from Arcadia Point there, and another where was the other one to be up on Eld, I think. Anyhow, to keep an eye on the Indians and make sure they weren't, you know, going off the island and trying to interfere with uh, folks trying to settle. Shellfish is really important to the uh, Squaxin Island tribe and some of the other tribes in the area. As they say, when the tide is out, the table is set. <coughs> and this is, you know, for many years, uh, the trading of, of uh, dried clams and oysters especially the Olympic oyster, or excuse me, the Olympia oyster was really important. One thing we're trying to underline and encourage our tribal youth, which Kansas Penn, again, the uh, climate change ecologist, we gave this little presentation to um, the tribal youth over on the reservation there at Camilchi. And as you might not be surprised, the youth are, are aware of these things, and climate change is an important issue to them. Um, the tribe talks about seven generations being aware of you know, your great-grandparents and then considering your what great-great-grandchildren. And these are the type of timelines that now we're seeing with sea level rise. This is real. It's happening. What is going to happen? So we um, <coughs> gathered some data. Well, I'll run you through real quick on the shelf this year. And this is fun stuff because we can, these ones just show which, uh, you know, where the tribe harvest on uh, state, tribal beaches, uh, private or state beaches, and then um, the ones that we enhance, which is when you take, uh, you guys may be familiar with Taylor shellfish, which of course is the largest you know, uh, shellfish producer here in Washington and perhaps in the country. It's millions of dollars in revenue for um, the companies and of course the workers. And we, we partner with uh, Taylor also on doing some water quality sampling and making sure that uh, the marine waters you know to be a rain event and Anything that's in the streams will wash down into the marine waters. And if, if you get too much of uh, fecal coliform, and you know what just happens, you know, leaking septic systems, or too much wildlife right in a particular stream or farm animals, then that can impact the water quality and shut down a shellfish bed. The tribe has really increased the amount of harvest it's had of these would be manila clams in the last 10 years or so. And that's really, again, provided tribal opportunity for folks and also, you know, tribes sits at the table with Taylor Shellfish and others to make sure the water quality is good. Oysters are another one we're trying to get back into and in bringing back, as I mentioned, the Olympia oyster, which historically was all over the South uh, Salish Sea and there was a huge boom in the uh, early 1900s. And then of course with logging and some other activities, unfortunately a lot of the beds were lost. Now it's mostly the Pacific oyster that we're all familiar with. We like to get, you know, include a picture of, we have a tribal member here, here's Fair Lewis Harvison, gooey duck. I don't know if anyone's a fan of gooey duck, but they are some wild creatures, right? <laughs> <laughs> 100 year old clam, that's wild. 
This is one Candace, Penn, and I uh, were out. We used our drone to get a shot up here on Squaxin Island. And this would be a gooey duck plot where they're planted um, as little juveniles. And you all have probably seen out on the beach those tubes. And what are all these tubes? Well, those keep you know the moon snails or crabs off of the baby gooey duck until they can establish themselves deeper down where they're safe from predators. So we've been doing a lot of enhancement on Squaxin Island. So this map here in the middle, and a little hard to see maybe on your screen, but what we so we used uh, lidar data. You have a plane fly over with lasers, and they bounce back and forth, and they give you very precise elevation information. And then we were able to take some data from NOAA <coughs> and their report on uh, sea level rise projections. And of course, we don't know is it going to be five feet or fifty feet, but we can we're starting to get an idea um, as you know our real data starts to follow some of these projections. So currently, we have. The yellow area on this map is the current sea level, or excuse me, shellfish band, because shellfish like to live in the intertidal area from about three feet to about 12 feet of mean low, level, mean low low elevation. Well, as sea level rises, you know those levels are going to be creeping up the beach, and as it hits the um, uplands, or if it's like a feeder bluff or something, then you're going to have that area being confined as it goes up. So you're losing area. You know if you have what do we have here? I think it was, we're, we're expecting to lose about 30% in the next 50 years. So that could be very significant. And these are also, you know, give us some ideas. These kind of changes for shellfish will have other impacts. Another important, um, important resource for the tribe is fishing, right? Salmon, of course, would be the one that's uh, both culturally and financially important. Um, forage fish, which are the little guys, sand lance, um, smelt, they're part of the food web and the food chain that are very important to uh, juvenile salmon as they you know, emerge from their streams and head out to Alaska or wherever they head. So we've been uh, surveying, Candace has been out surveying on Squaxin Island to see where do these forage fish spawn, which areas might be important to continue monitoring, um, and make sure those forage fish populations are happy and healthy. Here's a picture of the sand lance and the surf smell. And in here, we try to have other information that you could spend 10 minutes with this uh, story map, or you could spend a couple hours, you know. And we hope that it leads you to other information. If you want information on forage fish, you can go in here. Uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, who we partnered with on this stuff, uh, the forage fish part, they also are out you know, mapping a lot of other areas and surveying. So we had a training for, they came in and trained tribal members on how to uh, survey for forage fish, which their eggs are, I mean, tiny, tiny, tiny little eggs, so it's a process of, it's like, uh, mind, like panning for gold. You pan through to the smaller, smaller pebbles, and eventually you'll get some eggs, and then you get the microscope and try to identify what you've got. Here's a picture of Candace out on the beach doing one of her forage fish surveys. And of course, salmon. Um, I don't know if you have anybody ever make it down to the first salmon ceremony over at Acadia Point? Very good, yeah, that's always a fun event, right? It takes me back to my days when I worked at banquets, when we suddenly we got 300 people who want fish immediately. We're out of fry bread. <laughs> That's a really great event. That um, Arcadia Point out there is a really neat spot. Surprisingly, there is no tidal gauge in the South Salish Sea. The closest, you know, real what is the water level in the ocean? The closest one is Tacoma, and then up to Seattle. And something that we're hoping to partner with maybe USGS or NOAA to get a tidal gauge, a permanent one, installed. Um, somewhere in Olympia or Sheldon Harbor. So for this project, we installed two temporary temporary tidal gauges. One there at Arcadia Point, which you know is a spot right across from Squawks Island. And the other one is at Sheldon Harbor on uh, Taylor Shellfish's Flupsy. Again, the Flupsy is where they grow the little baby clams. So we've been collecting that data. And it's been interesting to see how those predictions from Tacoma, you gotta go through the narrows. There's a lot, there's a lot of you probably know, that, you know, 17 foot tidal swings around here. So that's a huge amount of water. Um, so getting those better tidal predictions not only helps us track sea level rise, but also gives us a better idea of when should we be out on a particular beach to do a harvest. And then we get into the fun stuff, the sea level rise. Although, you know, it's really not that much fun because it's pretty scary, right? Uh, there's really significant changes, big changes. Um, City of Olympia has also done a sea level rise project, which I'll, I'll show you a link to their, their series as well. This is a fun one. 
that is the NOAA sea level rise mapper. And this is another app that I've just embedded within this one. But you can, you know, everybody always likes to say, what's my house all about? So you can go in here and you can make the water level rise if you want. Let's, let's check out Shelton, right? And of course, Oakland uh, Bay here is such a productive uh, clam and oyster producing bay. And there's real concern that over time, as that sea level again creeps up and the beach becomes steeper, we're going to lose a lot of habitat. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Capital Land Trust, but they're one of our primary partners in the tribe through, uh, has helped Capital Land Trust purchase. We have the Twin River Ranch there at the head of Oakland Bay. And then the, one of the most recent acquisitions was here at the Bay Shore, the old golf course, which is really a beautiful site with some old uh, oak trees. And they, re, they uh, took out the berms, you know, they were keeping the salt water off the uh, golf course. So you go out there now, uh, again, it's Capital Land Trust, and you can walk in and check it out. Um, really a neat site, which historically, I, I believe the longest, longest <coughs> house, um, south of Seattle used to be at Oakland Bay. And, um, they would have pot latches, like uh, folks from Skokomish would come down, and the various uh, squawks and clans would gather. But check out this, uh, the NOAA Sea Level Rise Mapper. And they have, of course, a lot, bunch of links to other data. Of course, the causes of sea level rise, it's, it's really not rocket science, right? Things get warmer, you have ice and uh, glaciers melting, even just water itself expands when it gets warmer. And of course, um, other things like rain events can contribute to local sea level rise, like in downtown Olympia, if you had a lot of rain that issues river. And we try to use the latest and greatest uh, science for this stuff, and it's been, I guess we understand more, but every time they come out with a new report, the projections get a little worse. This here would be these lines, you can see on the bottom, the timeline. And then what are called representational uh, concentration pathways. That's essentially how much emissions are we, as a, you know, humans on the planet, producing. And of course, we would hope to be in the green, but we're certainly closer to the red. So on the left, you can see the meters of sea level rise. And we're starting to look more and more like, you know, we're closer to the orange yellow. So you're talking two meters of sea level rise here in the next 80 years. That will be very significant. In the next how many years? 80 years. 80. And these are again projections. And one thing I like to note when these sea level rise graphs, because of course projections are nice and smooth, that's not how reality works. If they, uh, you know, Greenland, some of those glaciers cave off, or Antarctica, as folks may know, they're destabilizing and you get these accelerating events where suddenly. It, would, it could potentially, you know, you might be going along and then you could have two feet of sea level rise in a year, which would be, you know, really significant to folks who live along the water and have uh, property or other stuff that could be inundated really quickly. Here's another one we did locally of <coughs> these representational concentration pathways. These would be in feet and we're going to 2200. So the worst, the most sea level rise from NOAA's projections would be 35 feet in the next 180 years. But even here, from 2100, you know, you're looking at, at 10 feet. So very significant. And it's gonna be really important that we partner with the local communities. And we actually had the city of Olympia came out and talked about their sea level rise project here recently. And again, we have a lot of links to some cool stuff here, the climate change synthesis report. I guess it's cool if you're into science, but a lot of the stuff is pretty depressing. <laughs> but we can partner with various folks to mitigate these risks and what are we going to do? We can probably need some levees around the city of Olympia. We may have to start um, raising houses up or stepping back uh, from the immediate shoreline. It's going to be really, it's going to be really difficult. I don't know if anyone has seen this map that um, was made by uh, Stephen Freeland up at uh, Huxley Environmental College up out of Bellingham. This was one of the ones that he first out this in the uh, late 90s. The term Salish Sea started to become uh, used again, and, and uh, the tribes were proponent of that, of course, back in the uh, paddle to Seattle in 1989, which the, the canoe journeys, which the tribe hosted in 2012. We had 6,000 folks from all different tribes, from Bella Bella, I think we even had some Maori from New Zealand, and folks from California, and 100 canoes showed up uh, out of Kimilchi, 
was quite an event. But this map helps us understand it. Hey, the Puget Sound, okay, well that's down here, and then the Strait of Georgia up there, but this area is all one large ecosystem, which, you know, the orca reminds us that they're, they're traveling all over the place. So we try to remember we're not alone in this struggle, and together we can um, share the science and, and hopefully come up with some ways to mitigate some of these risks. If anybody's into tidal datum, so let me know. We can talk. <laughs> How high is it? If you're out um, walking around, you'll see these uh, USGS brass discs in the ground and, or on the corner of a building or up on a mountain. You know, back in the day, in the 1860s or so, right when they started doing these surveys of the entire country, which is a fascinating thing in itself, where they literally used chains from, I believe it was in the middle of Kansas, I think it was Kansas, Iowa and literally leapfrogged their chains across the United States. And amazingly, they're incredibly accurate. These benchmarks allow us to go out with a GPS unit, you know, talking to satellites, and get a very precise elevation. Um, we went out to Squaxin Island, and we had a surveyor help us with this, but establish the beach profiles. Because again, as we see sea level rise creeping up, we expect beaches to become steeper, or there may be more erosion, or a change in the actual pebble size or substrate of the beach, which can affect clams and forage fish. When you talk about datums, you know, again, you're talking about mean low, low tide, mean high, high tide, and um, those things are different for different areas. We generally have immense tides. Yeah? I've heard a lot about Olympia and the way it's going to be inundated by the rising sea levels, but what about Shelton? Yeah, it's going to be significant. Let's, let's take a peek. This is why I love this, um, this NOAA mapper. And the NOAA, like I say, LIDAR data, which is the plane with the lasers. NOAA has some data, and there's actually some more data being, you know, since the OSO landslide, it's become really important to get really high quality data. And can we understand these risks, whether it's sea level rise or landslides? So um, DNR and USGS has partnered to fly most of Washington State and update these maps. Because this data that they're using for Shelton is not super high accurate. Of course, for, for uh, informative purposes, it works great. So with three feet of sea level rise, and again, this doesn't account for the storm surge, which is when you really have these big events where things get inundated and you have overtop you know, of uh, sea walls and whatnot, which of course there is a, a, uh, a wall down around the uh, lumber yard in Sheldon. But as you can see, it's not looking good at six feet. And again, this doesn't account for like a two foot storm surge. You know, that would be up here. So, yeah, I mean, we're not gonna get flooded here, but <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, um, it's significant. It's gonna require an immense investment in infrastructure, whether it's the bridges or the sea walls, or helping people move. And of course, you know, America, we have some pretty good resources around here. There's lots of places in the world where they don't have those resources they're going to have to move. It's going to be really difficult. Here's a picture of Candace Penn, who again is our climate change ecologist. This was a talk um, that she gave, however was this one? The, the, the uh, title of it was Estuaries Serve as the Buffer in Face of Climate Change. Oh, right. This was um, before the State House Festival, which was held for the first time last year in downtown Olympia, which is a really fun event to be there to see. Um, if he wasn't from the Black Eyed Peas, that was fine. Yeah, yeah, good times. You know, he's, uh, I think he uh, has some uh, Indian blood in him. I'm trying to, he was out at Standing Rock too, fighting hard. Um, which, yeah, if anybody wants to talk about that afterwards, we could. Pretty amazing when you're spraying protesters down with pepper spray for just protesting. I thought this was America. But this is neat where you can actually embed a video. You know, again, you can spend two hours with this thing or just 20 minutes. This is, really, this is one from a city of Olympia sea level rise mapper that, you know, that at its home. Hey, I go to the farmer's market, where am I getting my vegetables? One thing that's going on in downtown Olympia um, happened last year was there was the Port of Olympia approached Squaxin Island tribe and the Nisqually tribe, Billy Frank Jr., who a lot of you are probably familiar with, who's, you know, a real hero and a real warrior and a real honorable gentleman. Um, he's been honored with a trail that goes from the Children's Museum up to the uh, what's the Hearth Fire restaurant there, or there's a little park right at the end, which is actually where this Fox and Island canoe journey landing was when the hundred canoes came came ashore or welcomed ashore. 
So this one may, brings it home. You know, this is how high it's going to get. We need to do something. If you get a chance, go check out the Billy Frank Trail over there. Uh, we've been helping get ready to put in some interpretive signs that talk about uh, the Squally, Nisqually, and Squaxin cultures. And I've been working on some environmental panels. And another idea I have is to put a sea level rise pole down there. These have been used in different communities around the country. You have a pole that says, here's two feet, you know, here's four feet of sea level rise. And that really can bring it home. They, we're standing here, and I'm going to be underwater in, in uh, some time here in the future. <coughs> This was a cool panel that's now up on the uh, gym over at Kamilchi at the Squaxin Reservation um, with the Four Seasons and some other cultural stuff that the kids made and they really did a great job. Again, engaging with the youth is, is the most important. That's, you know, when your kids are nagging you about the recycling. Get it right, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> then we have a couple we linked here, the Seattle, uh, or excuse me, the Olympia story map. Charlene Kreiss, who's on tribal council and um, works over at the museum and uh, cultural center. If anyone's ever been out to the reservation and checked out the museum, it's really, it's really, they did a great job. They have the seven panels, one for each of the inlets. Oh, and I should mention on this, the presentation that Candace gave, um, we also are partnering with SLAM, who are the, excuse me, you know, it's, uh, the folks that are looking to take out the dam down there. Um, on the Deschutes River, because of course Capitol Lake, not much of a lake, and as an estuary, I'm, I'm from Maine, I grew up like near the mud flats, and to me that's, that's the smell of, you know, a functioning and healthy ecosystem, and I think if we can get the lake, the dam out of there, lose the lake, even if we have a small little reflection pond or something, but turning that into an actual healthy ecosystem will be good for salmon and for shellfish and water quality. So that's something we're hoping to do. And those were some of the folks who helped uh, sponsor the Stage House Festival. So then we were trying to engage with folks on what do we need now and where are we headed? So these are different ways of how to adapt, how to mitigate, and how do we start developing in a way that's gonna work for the future. Towards that end, we developed this other map application um, to partner with, again, our, the uh, Salmon Enhancement Group, so the Land Trust, where to find properties. There's only so much money, right? And there's a lot that needs to be done. Where can we protect stuff? And where, um, where is it maybe a good place to do a restoration project? Which here in Shelton, in Oakland Bay, we developed this pretty cool, pretty cool analysis that looked at a lot of different environmental factors, like the amount of bulkheading, and whether it's used by forage fish, and, the percent development, these different colors represent the percent development. And these guys are saying, hey, maybe don't do a restoration project over here because we're in the red, but maybe do do one in the green, or even you got one here, maybe because it's surrounded by green, that might be a good place to try to do a restoration. Whereas something you know, up here at the Bayshore Preserve, well, that would be preservation. So it's a different approach to um, natural resource management. And that one's been, been a, useful and a lot of our partners are using it. This one here we, we toot our horn to about some other properties that were that we've been helping out with. Most of them most of them has already already mentioned. And then what are we doing next? We're finishing um, the model in Oakland Bay to actually get a little more precise than Noah's sea level rise mapper. And of course we have our funders which was the BIA excuse me I guess I said EPA earlier it was BIA. And we, as I said, we talked to tribal council, made them aware of this stuff, and now that we're more aware of the risk, then we start, how do we adapt, and how do we mitigate these risks, and how do we plan for the future? We try to identify the various species that are at risk. Of course, folks love the orca, so we always try to key in on orca, and you go down to the salmon, then to the forage fish, and of course, uh, shellfish. And at the end, we talk about our references. Who all, we will have a report linked here, we're still polishing a few of these things. We want to add some cool videos and whatnot. Um, if anybody wants to report, that could be some good. Uh, I'm sure, you're having trouble sleeping. So, uh, <laughs> this one here, I want to get a little load. This GIS software. Do you have any uh, 
children, grandchildren, what have you, that are thinking about what should I do for my career, and if they like math, tell them to get into GIS. It's really, there's a lot of fun stuff you can do, and the ability to model, but I'm not sure if it's going to look darn it. Brian, yeah. I, Brian yeah. I have a bunch of questions here, but I want to hear from Ari and Jasmine sure. first, and then and, and maybe Phyllis, and then do a discussion. Sounds questions. great. Yeah. Ooh, let me just run this one quick. This is the one where council, uh, Scroxton Tribal Council, this is only going to be on Scroxton Island, and it's, this is a time series of what's going to happen. So we're stepping through time. You need to be that through 2040, 2050. And you'll see the water start to creep up. And so it's going to be called the Squaxin Highlands Tribe here. There are 2100. And this, again, is just a high tide, not accounting for a storm event. So by 2150, the island is islands every day at a high tide. And then by 2200, there's going to be five islands. So it's scary stuff. And uh, we will be using, it's a pretty big area, but we want to do this exact. Uh, modeling for the entire South uh, Salish Sea, so folks can, of course, say, where's my house? <laughs> and I think that's it. Yeah, please do. Hit me with the questions. No, let's have Ari and Jasmine, and then can we do your questions? Of course. Ari right, okay. Jasmine, please. Okay. So, these, these girls are from the Sunshine Movement Hub in Olympia, which is a huge movement across the whole nation. And um, I'm just going to let you guys tell about what we do. Sure. We have a presentation, actually. Oh, yeah, good. we do. Would you guys like to? Yeah. Please. All we have to do is it's just a it's a tab. Yeah. Okay. 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 about what we're doing in Olympia for Sunrise, so that one, you can start 
your own hub here potentially in Shelton and supplement the work that we're doing in Olympia, but also just to be more engaged and um, kind of free-flowing with the movement. You know, we were just talking about tides. <laughs> so we want to flow with the movement and we want to make sure that everyone's sort of on the same page with what's going um, on here in Washington. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jasmine to give a little overview of the various tiers of Sunrise. Um, and we're going to start with Sunrise National. Yeah, so um, I think definitely with, if anyone's been watching the news, um, we have definitely heard about some of the young people that have been really concerned about um, climate change and um, sort of calling on policymakers to sort of work on passing policies that adequately address these issues because um, frankly, it hasn't been that way recently. So uh, we know that a majority, a vast majority of young people um, support transitioning to 100% clean energy in America. So that has sort of led to a national movement um, called the Sunrise Movement. Um, this was formed some sometime around April 2017, uh, really started to gain notoriety and more traction um, during and after the 2018 midterm elections. Um, we definitely had some uh, successes during the 2018 midterm elections, but um, I think there were also <coughs> some things that we still needed to work on. Um, so Sunrise National just sort of serves as an umbrella uh, for uh, a lot of the other smaller hubs like ours, the Olympia Hub, as well as um, the state, uh, Washington, like for instance, Washington State Sunrise uh, Movement. And so basically what Sunrise National does is it serves as a, a, a centralized sort of location um, and uh, concentration of like resources for um, smaller organizations like the Olympia Hub to access. For instance, they do um, webinars, so Zoom calls for uh, different hubs to sort of tune into and figure out what's going on at the national level and also use those as sort of forums and places for people to um, have calls to action or days of action, sort of, sort of scheduling um, times to go out and lobby different elected officials and policymakers locally. Um, actually, the Olympia Sunrise Hub, um, our hub, just recently attended and did a viewing party for the uh, most recent National Sunrise um, webinar. And actually, Naomi Klein, the author of This Changes Everything, who was actually on that, that packet that you all set mm -hmm. out, was um, one of the speakers. So she sort of talked about why the Sunrise Movement really resonated a lot with her. <coughs> We had a lot of really young people um, who were uh, leading the movement, speaking on that Zoom call. So that was that's one of the resources that Sunrise National um, has for some of the smaller hubs around. Um, and of course, Sunrise National fo focuses on grassroots organizing. Um, the the power isn't really in the national hub. The power is in the smaller hubs, like like us. Um, and so we use those grassroots organizing um, and those resources to organize marches, rallies, protests, school strikes, um, really everything that you can think of in order to sort of mobilize the political will that we really need to be able to um, make a real difference. And another tool that Sunrise National um, supports and offers resources for smaller hubs um, to do, I guess, is to uh, ask local officials who are running for um, office to sign no fossil fuel campaign money pledges um, to agree not to take uh, money from fossil fuel companies and related companies so that they can uh, effectively put the power of the people or the interests of the people ahead of profits and environmental degradation. Sure. Yeah. So um, the Sunrise 
movement is largely spurred from this policy of, or pro, a series of programs called the Green New Deal. And it's largely based off of uh, the New Deal, which came out in the 1930s, just after the Great Depression. And they were a series of programs proposed by Roosevelt. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, to, I just want to make sure I'm not getting my presents confused. Um, to, uh, to make sure that we were building our country in a, in a way that it was strong, that was sustainable, and really created a country that we were once really incredibly proud of. And uh, these programs covered everything from better labor practices, social safety nets, employment programs, uh, better financial regulation, environmental regulation, um, and really took the three R's of relief, recovery, and reform and completely transformed this country into a really strong working class economy. Um, and as we see, that that is greatly shifting. It, um, I, I would even argue to say we got a little greedy <laughs> with um, with all the, the promise that this space that we actually began to kind of lose our core values um, in a really overwhelming capitalist system. And we began you know, redistributing power to different entities instead of keeping the power within the people. And you know, as we see the Green New Deal, we see sort of a revitalization of what that New Deal um, did for our country. So currently the uh, Green New Deal is a 14 page resolution. It's a really quick, quick read, it's a really great read, and I recommend you just Google Green New Deal resolution, giving it a read through. Um, I guarantee if you're reading a really depressing climate article and then you click on the Green New Deal, you'll feel so much better <laughs> knowing that people are thinking really critically about these issues. I mean, um, in just 14 pages, it encapsulates the exact and precise change that we need um, on a massive level. Um, but it, it really shows that people are thinking really critically and that we can develop strategies and plans and tactics <coughs> both nationally and within our respective communities to address the problems we face and meet the urgency that we need. And uh, this is, of course, led by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, who is a representative um, from the uh, 14th District in New York, which is the Bronx, which is where I did my undergrad, so like, holla to Alexandria. And um, a representative Marquis from uh, Mass Massachusetts. And they've kind of teamed up to really create this incredible resolution. Um, it's a 10-year national mobilization plan. So um, we're going to kind of see what that sort of looks like. So this mobilization plan um, recognizes the urgency of climate change with the latest climate science. In the last year and a half or so, we have been inundated with really terrible news from the International Governmental Panel on Climate Change, the most esteemed um, climate change body of scientists and experts on, um, on all kinds of fields related to climate science. Um, you know, they pretty much said that we have just about, if we're lucky, 12 years to rapidly transition our energy infrastructure to completely change our economy so that it's fair and, and just. And this movement and this, uh, this Green New Deal encapsulates that urgency. Um, to adjust transition to renewable energy, which is a lot of us here in this state really care about, and um, our state is working really hard to create a platform to do that, um, as well as the creation of millions of jobs in so many sectors, <laughs> um, even things that we haven't even uh, dreamed of yet <laughs> in terms of environmental restoration um, and recovery, uh, clean energy, uh, administration, community outreach and development. The list is goes on and on and on forever. Um, as well as infrastructural improvement. We know that we desperately need an infrastructural revitalization in this country. Um, so much of what we built during the times of the New Deal is now in need of retrofit and uh, reimagining. So uh, the Green New Deal encapsulates all of these qualities as well as many others. Um, really presents the opportunity for people to grab onto. Um, I don't know if Jasmine mentioned this, but the, the Sunrise Movement um, has taken this new deal, this Green New Deal, and has been carried by young people. Um, the Green New Deal is a youth-led um, climate movement. 
Um, and we saw on March 15th exactly how strong um, the power of the youth can be in expressing this movement and expressing the importance of having a habitable and liv livable future, um, not only for our current generation, but for generations to come. And in essence, what's been happening is that their future is being stolen from them. You know, we were, uh, you were just talking about timelines within 10 years from now. Um, but, you know, if a 12-year-old is standing here in 10 years, you know, she'll be 22, and then in 20 years, she'll be 32, and, you know, this is very much within her time growing up and developing that this is going to be happening, and as well as, as, well as ours. Much of our, you know, adult life will be spent dealing with these issues, so it's really important that we're addressing them now, and we're encouraging youth and empowered, empowering youth to take this message forward. So washing, um, this is a fine slide. Really good slide. Um, this is perfect. So there are um, currently eight hubs in Washington State um, that have formed just after uh, the defeat of 1631. I know a lot of us in this room are really, we're really upset about that. One thing that 1631 did accomplish, and I am so proud of this, and like my heart smiles, is that we have an incredible group of people in Olympia, and in Thurston County, and in Mason County, and counties all throughout Washington who deeply care about um, the state of the planet and our beautiful Washington state and want to protect it. And we were able to rally together and come together under that frame of mind. And after, you know, you form those connections and relationships, you know, it's wildfire after that. Um, so we were able to kind of leverage our frustration, but also our community connections and really just band together to continue planning our future forward. So we have a hub in Olympia. We work really closely in Olympia with the Tacoma hub, as well as the hub in Seattle. There's a Grace Harbor hub, there's a Spokane hub, and a Vancouver hub, and probably a lot of other ones that are Wawa hub. Wawa hub. Olympic Peninsula hub. Olympic Peninsula hub. All of them. I don't know how we hit them all, but yeah. We have a lot of them. We're popping up all over. Um, so, and hopefully there'll be a Shelton hub and or a Mason County hub that we can um, coordinate with. Um, so all together, um, we have certain tactics that uh, in Olympia and in Tacoma in particular we're really focusing on. And these um, four things have been sort of at the forefront um, of our priorities. It is important to keep in mind that Sunrise is a 100% volunteer organization. And as I describe my job interview, my job stuff, um, you know I'm a busy person. So um, a lot of us in our hubs just do what we feel that we have capacity to do at the moment. Um, youth are really busy. <laughs> they have very busy lives and um, obligations. Um, but we really focus on these four things when we get together and kind of plan things. We also do things in different, uh, like respectively in different time frames. So where I am helping to plan a march right now, my, uh, Mason often plans the lobbying events. So we kind of divide and conquer in our sh as a strategy instead of just planning all things together. And we individually do what we feel is in capacity, that we have capacity to do, and then bring it together under the larger frame of our work. Um, and we're, we are working on our leadership structure. Like I said, this was formed in, you know, shortly after 1631. Um, so we are still in a developmental phase in Olympia and welcome any kind of constructive feedback when it comes to organizing and things like that, as well as welcome your presence um, in joining us for this. So um, in terms of lobbying, we've had three days of action where we've gone to Representative Denny Heck's office um, in Lacey and have asked him continuously to support the Green New Deal. Um, you know, his representative or his uh, legislative assistant, Dallas Roberts, is really wonderful and he always takes the time, the hour and a half or so that we're there with our signs and we're singing with the Raging Grannies um, to listen to us. <laughs> They're wonderful. They actually wrote a song called The Green New Deal. I don't know if you've heard it yet, but it's really charming and amazing. <laughs> um, and, uh, 
you know, Danny Pack has continuously said that he supports environmental reform and legislation and still has not uh, signed on to the Green New Deal yet, but we won't stop until we hear a definitive answer from him. Um, so, and he is our congressional representative, so he has to, you know, we have to hold him to the standard of supporting this. And then uh, marches and rallies. So uh, this is something that we are, uh, we are all kind of working on incorporating. I, for Sunrise Washington, am, help, am helping to plan a youth climate rally with Washington Environmental Council, our climate, Plan for the Planet, as well as many other organizations. Um, I'm helping to kind of have a Sunrise presence um, and engage and uh, educate what the Sunrise movement is and incorporate youth, youth engagement um, into that. That's sort of my job, of working with Sunrise um, on this rally. Um, but we try and individually work on these opportunities if we have the time to do so. And then strikes and protests, you know, um, like Robert Marino, who has two really young boys now, um, he has been uh, organizing a lot of the strikes. Um, he organized a, a pretty small one um, in Olympia on the 15th for youth climate. He said, without any real um, organizing for it, he was able to turn out about 50 people, which is pretty great for not having a lot of time to plan an organizing event, as well as grassroots education and outreach. So we have a number of meetings where we discuss how we want to expand, how we really want more youth um, to join our movement. Um, in Olympia, it's a little saturated, uh, environmental activism is a little saturated with um, some of our elder folks, which is amazing, and we need that support, but we really do want a, a stronger body of youth to work in congruency <coughs> with some of our older, our older activists and to learn from our older activists. So we are working on that. Jasmine, do you want to add anything to that? Um, <laughs> honestly, I think a lot of this stuff um, happens definitely at, on the Olympia Hub level, but also nationally. And we see that, um, we see that in the news. So definitely we've, like the school strikes that have been going on um, as a result of, you know, some of the the Green New Deal um, sunrise situation definitely is something that um, we need to remember in the whole, you know, sunrise context. So, so um, you guys segued nicely with lobbying into our next guest is Phyllis Farrow from the Leaving Olympia, who spends a lot of time at the legislature. And and then after Phyllis is done, about 15, 20 minutes, we can ask everybody questions. I have some. We're <laughs> almost done. I think we have like oh, one more slide after this. Sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> we're almost done. I promise. So, uh, so the, these are just some photos. Um, so that's Lisa Grimm. She's the Sunrise uh, coordinator for Tacoma, and she's with the mayor of Tacoma, Victoria. Um, yes, Woodards. Woodards. Mm -hmm. um, and then underneath her is. Um, Nathaniel Jones, who is an Olympia City Council, he's also running for mayor, and they're both holding <coughs> a pledge to not take fossil fuel monies. One of the biggest uh, things that we're trying to do is highlight those who take are, are elected to take money from fossil fuels or utilities who still rely heavily on fossil fuels, and ask them to sign a no fossil fuel money pledge to get our money out of big oil. Um, and then up in the corner, um, we have a beautiful need to be brave. We're telling Denny Heck um, at City Council that he needs to be brave and actually support the Green New Deal. Um, and that's myself and Mason, Rolf, and several other really beautiful Olympia community and Lacey and Tumwater community members. And then underneath that is a Tacoma preparing for, a group from Tacoma preparing for the climate strike. Um, and if you haven't gone on New York Times or to like see the photos of the international movement and the international climate strike, I mean, I broke down for a good 20 minutes just crying because it's just so powerful to hear children speak about climate issues. It's mm -hmm. amazing. It's really powerful. Um, and then these are a set of principles that um, Sunrise embraces. And I, we just encourage you to read through them really quick. If you find yourself or resonate with any of these particular principles, like we encourage you to participate in Sunrise. Um, 
you know, we are nonviolent in word and deed. We are Americans from all walks of life. We grow our power through talking to our community. These are all really powerful, powerful things. Um, you know, we take initiative, we embrace experimentation, and we learn together. We shine bright. We stand with other movements for change. These are all really powerful things. And here is your opportunity to get involved with Sunrise and with some other really incredible um, people in the community. So this evening, tonight, at my big coffee at 5 p.m., um, we have a youth engagement meeting. This is where we're going to be brainstorming how to incorporate um, high school students and elementary students into the movement. Um, we have a general meeting Tuesday, March 26th at the Mix 96 studio downtown. Um, that's our meeting space. And then on Thursday, April 11th, we have a youth climate rally and networking. This is the rally that I'm helping to prepare. It's going to be really great. It's a free event. If any of you have children, um, well, please bring them. It's going to be a really amazing opportunity to bring everyone who's like was at the climate strike together to network with one another and talk with one another and strategize and organize and learn from <coughs> us organizers. All kinds of really fun stuff throughout the day. And then, um, of course, our South Sound Climate Action Convention, which this year is going to be at Olympia High School on April 13th. Um, registration is now up, so if you go on southsoundclimateconvention.org, uh, registration, early bird registration is uh, 30 bucks. It includes your ticket, lunch, refreshments throughout the day, workshops, sessions, speakers, a reception, a play, all these amazing things. Um, and it's going to be a great day. And Thurston uh, League of Women Voters is a major sponsor, uh, co-sponsor of this uh, Yes, yes. League of Women Voters is very much participation, participating in that. All right. Great. We can, we can encourage our grandchildren. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's work great opportunities for the convention and all, all kinds of awesome stuff. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. And my name is Phyllis Farrell. I'm the uh, Washington League of Women Voters Climate Issue Chair. And I'm not a climate scientist or an expert. I'm a retired school teacher, but I have an interest, a lifelong interest in science sorts of things, environmental things, and climate. So what I do is I pull together information from people that are more expert than I am and try to pull it together and um, uh, utilize the vehicle of the league to advocate for uh, policies and strategies to address climate change. I'm preaching to the choir here. You guys have had a couple really good presentations. I think you all know. But I've got a few handouts. Take one if you want. Pass it on if you don't. But I'm going to start off with the league's position on climate change. And uh, as most of you know, the league's nonpartisan. Uh, we focus on issues. And we get our positions from the national uh, position on climate change, and then our state policy on climate change. Those are online. Most of you are probably familiar with that. But any bill that we look at uh, to decide whether or not to support or oppose has to be based on the league's position. If the league doesn't have that position on that topic. You know, we, we, we don't engage with it. But uh, the first handout that I'm passing around is the issue paper that cites the league's position, you know, that the league believes that climate change is a, uh, a, 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 an important issue, a, a, a national security issue, and requires immediate action. Uh, that's why the league endorsed uh, Initiative 1631 that Ari uh, talked about. That was the carbon fee uh, initiative because uh, the League also advocates putting a price on carbon. Carbon is a problem. I, I think you all know that. Carbon dioxide and some other greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And the League uh, supports strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, I have on the back page of that issue paper, I'm going to do with my own here. Uh, the back page of that, the updated web page for this week. And these are the bills that we are actually um, uh, supporting, 
uh, I don't have any on there that we are opposing, but the major issues for the league to address climate are uh, reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, 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 clean energy, and that is Bill 5116. Uh, uh, the, the House Companion Bill uh, did not survive, but 5116, and it's on, on here on the back. Um, uh, clean uh, transportation, so we're looking at bills that, that require cleaner fuels and uh, uh, supporting electric vehicles uh, and uh, uh, funding the governor's bill 5971, which is a budget bill, calls for a carbon fee to help with transportation funding. Okay, uh, so our, our major issues are clean energy, uh, if, uh, efficiency in buildings and appliances uh, to reduce water and energy uh, use, um, uh, getting nasty pollutants like methane and hydrofluorocarbons, reducing uh, those uh, uh, emissions, and reducing food waste. And I've got these on here. 1114 is reducing food waste. I was a little surprised to learn that food waste, besides being wasteful, is a major greenhouse gas emitter. So we all need to do that. So uh, I've got on there the, the, the bills, and if you are so inclined, most of you get the newsletter, the weekly newsletter from the league. Okay, and you can click on those bills, and I've got here uh, when some of the hearings are, for example, uh, Let's see here, uh, 1110, that's uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, with transportation fuels. That's got a hearing on, what's today, Tuesday, Thursday. So, uh, and, and I've got it on here as it indicated in the Senate Energy, uh, uh, Environment, Energy, and Technology Committee. If you're so inclined if, uh, to uh, notify your reps to, to uh, support that. Um, 11.14 on food waste, that's also Thursday. Um, 51.16 has a, uh, that's the clean energy one, has a bill uh, or a hearing on the house finance on also a lot's going on on Thursday. And uh, there's another one that we are also supporting and Amy has been involved with as well, 54.89, that's uh, kind of an environmental, social justice uh, in terms of environmental issues. So we kind of, have coordinated on that, and that's got a hearing this afternoon at 1.30. Um, so I meant to get there this morning and sign in, but it's an action alert on my page. Okay, so hopefully, so hopefully people okay, will click on that. All right. So uh, that's kind of what the league is doing. Uh, there's another uh, uh, handout going around that also summarizes other uh, environmental uh, issues. Uh, or, uh, let, let's look at this one uh, right here, the one that has the little graph there. Most of you all know that greenhouse gas emissions and carbon emissions have gone up. Uh, I mean, if anyone's not sure that, that, that that's climate change is real, that's on this, the front of this. But on the back, it has some nice little graphs. And with the emphasis, most of us here, you know, are worried about our grandkids' future. So that's why we're doing this. And I meant to say earlier how heartened I am by young people. I've gotten involved in several environmental groups, Sierra Club, League of Women Voters, the Thurston Climate Action Team, um, you know, a number of environmental organizations. And most of us that are there and involved are people that have the time, they're retired. And we need the young people. It's been my observation when lobbying that these poor legislators, well, I shouldn't say poor legislators, but these kind of people are sitting there, they're enduring hours of listening to testimony, much of which is very repetitive. You can tell a lot of them are reading their emails and, and you know, they, they already have a position, but you put a young person in front of them, and the younger the better, everyone stops and they listen. So that is a, a really good strategy. Anyway, um, another handout that's got on the front, clean electricity, clean transportation, clean buildings, and more. And on the back of it, uh, and I'm, I'm being brief because I know uh, it's getting late, um, Thurston County and Candace Penn 
is part of the Thurston, Re Thurston Regional Planning Council, even though she's from Mason County, but she's participated in a several year plan with representatives from the cities, Tumwater, Lacey, you know, Yelm, the counties, uh, the different agencies, the county agencies, anyway, and they've had consultants come in. Uh, I attend some of these meetings, but they put together a really ambitious Thurston Climate Adaptation Plan. And it's massive and complicated, but it covers everything from sea level rise to transportation to food waste and that sort of thing. And on the back of this handout, I put some of the strategies that they have outlined uh, that, that are reflected in this Regional Climate Action Plan for Thurston County. And I don't know what Mason County is, is doing in that regard. Do you guys have a county regional planning type organization? Well, and that might be something that the league might suggest to your county commissioners that they partner with Thurston or, you know, that we have a regional South Sound something. But these are some specific strategies that Thurston County is implementing uh, to address uh, climate change issues. So I'm sure I've forgotten a bunch of stuff, but. Uh, you know, I have a whole lot more articles if you're interested in, you know, the sources of the greenhouse gas emissions. I quit trying to figure out blaming China or India or anything like that. Let's focus on what we can do here, local, what we can do here. I can't affect. Excuse me, can you repeat the title of the Thurston County? Okay, it's on the handout that has clean electricity, clean transportation, clean buildings, and more. And on the back side, it has possible PRPC climate strategies. Did you find it? Ah, that's the title? T R. Yeah, I get that. That's the title. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, and then I think I also passed around another one that was just uh, some of the climate uh, bills that are before the legislature, the strategies and priorities. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Um, I asked the young people and you, because uh, I'm assuming you're part of the Thursday League. Yes. Are you concentrating on getting your members registered to vote as soon as they're eligible? Absolutely. I, an old advocate friend of mine, or a, a friend, a long time friend, mm -hmm. was always reminding everybody that elected officials want your vote. Yes. And so that is something that you could tell Denny Hack and all the rest of your elected officials that we vote and the more you can make that visible i think the more they'll pay attention they do pay attention to young voices that's true mary hall our county auditor has been very active in expanding voting opportunities uh, she was part of a bill to pre-register young people when they get their driver's mm -hmm. license. Mm -hmm. They're uh, doing uh, presentations in the high schools and the colleges. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the League is traditionally a democracy, a voting uh, group. Mm -hmm. Some of us in the climate and environmental realm says, yeah, that's great, but if we don't have a planet, you know, uh, we, you know what, we, we really need to give equal emphasis, I think, to addressing, I, this, this climate business, I think, is an emergency. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's really important that we reverse mm -hmm. some of the damage that, that has taken place and, you know, at least arrest it. So, uh, yes, uh, definitely working with the young people. Amy, have you talked about coffee with the league here? Probably only at the board. I think the board is aware of it, but not with the... Something that I would encourage you to do, what Thurston League has started, is on a weekly basis at Mud Bay Coffee, where the Sunrise people meet, at 10 o'clock every Tuesday morning. And so I think it'd be a great ladies' road trip, you guys. You know, go, go to Coffee with the League. It's for one hour. Paula Holroyd has lists of bills with talking points. She has the pre-stamp postcards. 
She has the labels for, you know, your national reps, your county commissioners, the city people, and people will look at a, a, a bill, she'll have maybe eight to ten, look at a bill, okay, I want to write about that one, dash off, please support this for this reason or whatever, they, there's talking points, put, put a label on it, and most people write ten to fifteen postcards in an hour while we're having coffee and chatting and all of that, and then everybody leaves at 11 o'clock on the dot. So it's a really good way. Uh, uh, we always have some of the environmental bills that are here, the league bills that are here in hearings that week, and with who to write, and it's very easy. So that would be something. Again? Tuesday mornings, 10 o'clock, Monday coffee. Where is Monday? Okay, it's very, you know where that Providence Medical, as you get off Black Lake Boulevard? Across the street from Trader Joe's, yeah. that exit, so you go up the hill, you are walking. It's, it's on Cooper Point Road, right after you go past the auto malls, if you're right. There's a big sign. Yeah, yeah. By Barnes and Noble, and There's so it's a on the office If you Google it, it'll give you the address, but what I had to look for was the Providence Medical Center, it's right by that. Because otherwise it's kind of tricky to find. But it's right off the freeway. It's right off 101. <laughs> okay? But 10 o'clock, so 20 people come, men and women. They sign postcards, have coffee. It's, it's a nice social thing. And a lot of them go to lunch afterwards or whatever. You know, do your shopping. But make a road trip. Come, come to the coffee with the lead. Thank you, Phyllis. Yeah, okay. Thank you. question for you. Sure. Hopefully it'll be quick. Um, so one of the problems with climate change, climate changing is population. We're growing more people, more people. And I didn't realize that you said that the sea level rise will choke off some of the shellfish growing, yeah, which is a concerned. huge source of food. That's a very good point. Yeah. Uh, I didn't think of that. That's terrible. It, we'll have to start growing them in, in bags and nets yeah. and hanging. It's interesting when we did our analysis of the shellfish and then the orange fish, and as I was saying, like the beach now is kind of flat and broad and over time it made. But then there was, when you go over this hump on Squawks and Island anyway, which you know the glaciers, scrapes do everything down here, there will actually be more shellfish habitat oh. in 2200. At least, you know, just okay. you only look at the how wide and how okay. steep things are. Of course, there's account for the substrate or what else may happen with the road. So changes. But, yeah, we don't know. Uh, I just wanted to say this, just as an announcement. Please. Uh, the House resolution on climate change, that website is on the uh, general membership meeting announcement that I sent out a week ago, no, not a week ago, five, six days ago, a week ago. Uh, the website that I gave you did not have the, the resolution number yet, but now it does. So it's resolution 109. Uh, I also wanted to tell you that if you go to the reminder announcement that I sent out yesterday, there are, are websites that I listed. It's about four or five, uh, one or two of which will give you information on the student global strike, which was on Friday. And there you can see pictures of kids, young people uh, from all over the world. It's just incredible. And the last website on that page is a little nine-year-old reading a book that he wrote. It's short, <laughs> like two or three minutes. And it, I mean, it, it's really, how can I say it? It's really moving really moving. Uh, and I, I would like to pass around a couple things. One, it's on that 
website, it's a website that I gave you on the meeting announcement, but this is just a one-page deal on the Green New Deal. It just does a summary of what's in it. Yeah. I have to tell you, they're right. If you're depressed, read that. <laughs> it really, it really is aspirational and hopeful for the and, and there's one more I want to pass around. It's a fact sheet, the role of agriculture in the Green New Deal. We were just you were talking about food. Uh, this is from the Organic Consumers Association. That's it. Thank you. Um, this is for Brian. Do um, you get a lot of federal funding uh, to do all the trapping? Yes, I do. My, my, I'm, my salary is from the EPA water quality. Okay. And then we go out with the Department of Health on a marine sampling. If you get a high hit, then you go up to the watershed. One of our uh, environmental technician goes out and there's about 10 creeks that he samples on a monthly basis. And then we coordinate with Mason County uh, and Taylor Shellfish, not as much with Thurston. But it definitely is collaboration on, like, you know, where yeah. is this fecal column for getting uh, where they're coming from and getting on our shellfish. Because it's not just food, it's also jobs. When you talked about mitigation of Oakland Bay, I wonder how the existing pollution and years of yep. dumping into that area so is some of that was wound in. Yeah, some of that was dredged, although I'm not going to write it. You can ask Scott Stelzner, a research scientist, where they, where they take that dredging. Um, I thought they decided, I thought the decision on that Oakland Bay study just quite a while ago was that the best thing to do is to just leave it. And yeah, leave it and a lot of it was capped, right? And then yeah. built. Because it, historically it was dredged to make room to dump all the, all the uh, trees or lumber. Um, and that's why the creek, as you guys know, when you drive through shelves, it's just like a concrete bloom, which is Gold Road Creek, which is hard for the coho to get up. So the restoration project is bringing in fill on top of the cap. I think some of the hottest stuff was removed, and then they capped it. And now they're putting in clean fill on top, which is going to make a salt marsh. And then over time, the stream will bring down sediment, and that salt marsh we would hope would build up. It's been a focus for the tribe and other environmental folks. Is hey, these salt marshes are a buffer against you know, storms or sea level rise, and hopefully they can provide some sort of a buffer, and they'll you know aggregate and continue to build over time. I understand Ray here was responsible for some of that in the 50s and was supposed to clean it up. They, they, they ever? Yeah, they, they were one of the partners and I think we provided some of the, I don't know how much mm -hmm. funding, but for sure some of the funding, yeah. yeah. What is the uh, tribe doing to help enlighten our policymakers? And I'm especially interested in those representing Mason County. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I Candace Penn, who was really active on the 1631 initiative, and we were, you know, kind of surprised that, that didn't pass through. But I guess that's what happens when you just pour millions of dollars from the economic folks into it and, you know, scare people with, you're going to lose $400 a year. Of course, that's what's going to happen in 20 years, you know, when your house just got washed away. But, um, so that's, that's a good, I'll, uh, if you'd like, I'm going to leave some cards uh, with Linda and you guys can follow with me. I'll direct you to Candace. She's, you know, she is uh, much more active in the community groups. I'm the science guy when they want data or maps to come to me. But, you know, <laughs> Candace is very involved in, in like the Thurston uh, Regional Action Team. I think that's the, the proper term. Thurston Climate Action Team. Yeah. And the Thurston Regional Planning. Yeah. It's a, it's a group effort, right? Like we're all, there's one thing working for the Scotts Mountain Tribe that I've become aware of is the tribe says our ceded lands go from Nazi Helms, Mount Rainier to Vashon Island. There's a, all these communities are within the ancestral lands of not just the Scotts, but the Nisqually Tribe. So coordinating and collaborating is how we're going to solve these problems regardless of who's, you know, at fault. It's all of our responsibilities to improve these things. Yeah, I have a question on infrastructure. We don't talk about it a whole lot, but it seems like the Highway 1 going from Mason County to uh, uh, Thurston County is going to be inundated. That's going to be a tunnel someday. No, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're so right. You're so right. That's, I think even at a really high, um, this, this spring or the new tides, now it's not much more than a foot.
foot or two below the bridge there in Danny Creek. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and, and that's the infrastructure stuff that has been touched on. The Thurston League has been doing a series of water forms, but David Trout and the Nisqually Tribe at the first one talked about the necessity because of sea level rise and flood risk of raising I-5 from DuPont there uh, to, well, there are two plans, one across the valley, the Nisqually Valley there, putting it on piers, evidently, which was what it was supposed to be in the first place, and then there's a stretch to Tumwater, but uh, there's a big flood risk right now with it. Um, and to restore estuary function as well, to help salmon recovery. Yeah, I mean, that begs the question for me, is like there's so many, like you were, you young ladies were saying about things we can't even begin to imagine. I mean, the, the like we're addicted to our cars and we're in our cars, and, and it seemed like it would be so much simpler to get a transit system that was in re dealing with some of these issues in, a bigger picture way, and then we were talking about the, the farming because lots of the low lying area is going to be covered with water, likely, and that's a lot of our farmland. So and, um, uh, and then the other elephant in the room, in my mind, is like a lot of immigration is happening because of the climate change. Because people are living in places are are unlivable for a lot of reasons, probably climate related. So. Um, I'm feeling like there's a lot of things that we, I mean, just like using less plastic and, you know, getting our energy straightened out, that, those are all good things. Getting, getting the water cleaned up, that is really important, but there's a lot of, like, there's a lot of things that are so big. <laughs> you know, inertia is a very powerful force, right? Everyone's got Well, I got out of bed to come here today, so that was something. <laughs> <laughs> there's a question over here. Please, so it's kind of a follow-on question about legislation that, that we're just talking about. Yeah. Uh, you know, according to the Washington Conservation Voters, our representatives have in our district here have some of the worst environmental yes. voting records in the state. And in fact, one has a score of zero out of hundred. Depends how you look at it, I guess. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yet, uh, Is it the county commissioners. You know, Squawks and Tribe, you have a, a huge amount of power <coughs> in our area, I mean, yeah. being the largest employer, yeah. and, and you seem to have the ear of our representatives. Yeah, Denny comes out and visits with the tribe at least during election time. Yeah. Yeah. And others are in our, in our yeah. district. So, is there some way that you can kind of bend the ears of some of those representatives that have these terrible environmental records to well, I guess to I'll, to the I'll quote uh, Billy Frank. Sue the bastards. Billy knew that you might represent, you might be in the legislature for a term or two or eight, but the reservation's not going anywhere, you know, and my grandchildren aren't going anywhere. And so that kind of, if you can't beat them at their game, just, you know, wait them out on, on your game, which I think is a, is a wise approach for the tribes. But they definitely try to be a seat at the table. So I'm, I'm not talking about Dan Hatch, you know, I, I think he uh, listens to us, but, but the tribe also it's supports. It's re-election all the time, right, with two year terms, it doesn't really make sense, but yeah. I know the Squaxin tribe has written very pointed letters to Thurston County Commissioners, and I'm assuming uh, Mason County Commissioners about water issues, so. Yeah, yeah, it's not just about the economic right. or the cultural, it's I mean, for human health as well. Amount of, uh, you guys are probably familiar with the uh, consumption rates for lead and mercury and things in our food. And for like in tuna or what have you, um, tribal members eat a lot more uh, you know, harvest foods like salmon or shellfish. And I think it was uh, until recently they changed it. It was one can of tuna a month. That's what they said. Hey, this much mercury is fine. Who's yeah, eating one geez. can of tuna a month? Like the Indians are eating a can a day of you know, the equivalent of salmon or it's there's no safe level of mercury. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. that's not what DuPont comes in, right? It may not kill you You're so right, though. Okay. Especially for, especially for you know, unborn and, yeah, yeah, no doubt. 
Um, we have time for one more. Oh, question. mine's really short for the Sunrise Hub leaders. Um, so you mentioned that there is a no oil pledge that some um, candidates have signed. And ha is that available online? Can you find that? Yes, I. We can send it to okay, the lead helpful. email. Yeah. Of course. We're collecting those. Good. Yeah, if you could send us an email. Um, I gave you uh, a copy of our brochure. I believe our email address is on the front. Great. Brian, could you pass out a few cards? Yes, I'll leave one to you if I would. Okay. I got it. Yep. So if anybody okay. wants to be invited to the, the coffee uh, club and wants to go there and let me know, um, You've come a few times, haven't you? Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I know about this. That's how I pass it on a little bit. But um, I think that we need a, at least a volunteer or two to do this on a, on a, a weekly or even monthly basis, because especially now is really important, because now is when we have the voice to, um, you know, to send our, our legislators our opinions. So I think we should do this right away and um, get busy going over there and at least it's only one hour. Yeah. It's I only one it. hour. It's it's road trip. It's on a road trip. trip. It's on a Tuesday morning. It's it's a people who want to get up early in the morning and get it done with, and then do your shopping and come home. It's really, you know, it's a good idea. Make a day of it. So email me or whatever you want to do, and let's do this. Thank you. Thank you to our speakers.